my coffee cup. I'm under caffeinated as yet this morning. So. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna amp you up really yeah, really quickly yeah. here. Um, is that better? Okay, great. Uh, so, given that we're talking about an area in which we do experience a lot of denial, level the playing field of information for us. What are what are the top hits that we all need to know about uh, about climate change today and how it may affect us? Oh boy! So you want uh, <laughs> yeah, climate one hundred and one in three minutes? Is that the is that that's, the that's kind of it? <laughs> uh, let's see. The planet is warming up. Uh, not much question about that. Uh, there are people out there who say it isn't, but it is. We have these things called thermometers, and we've actually had them since uh, early in the 19th century, and we have a long temperature record, and we know for a certainty that it's warming up. Uh, that warming was first predicted in the 19th century. Uh, people figured out uh, by the 1860s, as I'm recalling, that the Earth is a warm place because we have this uh, small amount of this gas in the atmosphere called carbon dioxide. Without it, uh, the heat that comes in from the sun would be just bouncing back to space, but the CO2 sort of acts like a blanket, uh, 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 trapping that heat long enough to, without it, the Earth would just be a frozen wasteland. And so uh, uh, in the 19th century, people first predicted, well, gee, if we add a lot of this to the atmosphere, we're going to change things, aren't we? People specifically in the 19th century predicted the melting of the Arctic, for example. Uh, by the 1950s, we were measuring uh, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and seeing that industrial activity is causing this relentless uh, steady increase. Uh, if you, we've now got uh, records going back a million years and you can see that through all the ice ages and all the huge changes in the geological history of the Earth, the CO2 was bouncing around in this fairly narrow band from about 100, these numbers are not going to mean much, but just bear with me, 180 parts per million to 280. So you draw that chart out over a million years and look at what we're doing right now, and sort of the last hundred years have been this straight line. If you guys remember uh, An Inconvenient Truth, with the Al Gore film, that's the point where he gets up in the cherry picker and goes all the way to the ceiling of the, of the auditorium to sort of show people what's happening to the CO2 concentration. Uh, I guess the question in a lot of people's minds is, is this really human activity? Uh, we are, science, science rarely claims dead certainty on anything, but we are to a pretty high degree uh, certain that it is, uh, and that continued uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and methane and a few other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will take the temperature of the planet uh, to levels uh, that are profoundly threatening. Uh, as we sit here, uh, having warmed up uh, on a planetary scale by a couple of degrees Fahrenheit, that's a lot of warming, by the way, for a planet. Uh, we are seeing that every piece of ice on the Earth is starting to melt. Uh, we are seeing an, uh, an escalating uh, rise of the ocean. Uh, we're already seeing uh, neighborhoods flooded in Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Virginia, uh, the, these problems, we're, we're in a moment of transition, I think, where the public is beginning to see it with their own eyes, and these problems are going to get worse and worse. Uh, we are beyond uh, a, a point of urgency here in needing to lower our emissions uh, and ultimately bring them down to zero, uh, and at a global scale, we have not begun to lower them at all. They are still rising, and so we're in a very deep hole, and we're digging it deeper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the glass is half empty here in the Center for Journalism Ethics, but let's talk about um, climate science or climate change denial. So when I look at it, I see sort of three primary groups of people. Um, so those who deny that this change is happening, those who deny that humans cause it or are a primary cause, and then those who say the impact is not as certain as as we as as may be argued so you know humans are an innovative lot and we can do things to counteract this what what do you make first of all am i right <laughs> with those with those uh, those groups what do you make of them and how do, how does that affect the work that you do uh, i think it is right uh, and you know you, you kind of, you've kind of given those in the correct order of uh, sort of uh, maybe increasing degrees of plausibility uh, the people who say there's no temperature trend um, are just crazy. I mean, that's just a lie. Uh, uh, 
the, 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 at the other extreme, you know, what I consider to be the most respectable form of climate skepticism is the argument uh, that, well, humans are, humans are innovative. We have a huge capacity to adapt. Uh, I mean, we truly don't know, you know, as, as, the, as the crunch comes and things get really bad, you know, how good will we be about sort of meeting that challenge? Uh, and so if you want to sort of um, have some optimism about that, I think that's, uh, that's rational. Uh, still, uh, you know, we, so we don't really know the sort of the full distribution of risk, I would say. Uh, it's, it's still plausible that this will be slow enough that even though the changes are likely to be huge, we, we, will, we will be able to adapt. You know, if, if, the, if the sea level rise should remain at the current rate, for example, uh, that's probably not going to become a crisis for civilization. Uh, the risk is uh, that things really accelerate. And we, we really don't know uh, if we're in an all-out, you know, sort of civilization destabilizing uh, crisis, uh, what's going to happen? I mean, we're starting to see some real strains. The refugee crisis has a climate component, as many of you know. Uh, that's putting, uh, you know, democratic governments under uh, under under threat and kind of in retreat all over the world. Um, and this is this strikes me as sort of early days of what we're likely to see. So it's plausible to sort of say, you know maybe we'll be able to adapt. I, my reaction to that is we're going to be able to adapt better if we slow it down. You know, slowing it down is just a good idea, period. Um, it, well, yeah, that certainly that certainly makes uh, tremendous sense to me. One thing that doesn't make sense to me is um, I, th I think some people fall into the trap when they think about uh, unfounded skepticism or denial. Uh, they they tie it, they think about climate change primarily. I think if you ask everybody in this room what's the biggest denial issue, they would say climate science. Um, but, and then they tie that ideologically to the right. Yeah. But I, I don't, I certainly see it on the left. Do you, do you as well? Um, you know, you've, you've been passionate about science since you were a kid in yeah. Georgia. Where, yeah. where do you see it? Uh, absolutely no question that the, the political left is also prone to this uh, unfortunate mental reflex of sort of not wanting to accept scientific facts. Uh, probably the best example right now is the anti-GMO um, ideology, anti-genetic engineering. Uh, uh, there's essentially no scientific evidence that it poses any, it certainly poses no risk to the safety of the food supply uh, that we've been able to, to pick up. Uh, there are some, in my mind, some environmental questions about uh, GMOs that are not completely answered to my satisfaction, but they're sort of largely answered. Um, I'm not real worried about it. Uh, and yet you have a passionate sort of, you know, GMOs are poison, you know, uh, they're killing people sort of uh, thing on the left that I think is crazy um, and, and just not grounded in scientific reality. Another example, although it's sort of, you, it's a weird, weird, cuts weirdly across the political spectrum is um, the, the anti-vaxxers, the anti-vaccine people. Uh, and there's a comp complex, unfortunate history to that, uh, that that has to, you know, that played out mostly in Britain, but we've had this kind of spillover effect uh, in the United States of the phony claim that vaccines cause autism. Uh, so we have a bunch of celebrities running around, you know, telling the American public that vaccines are dangerous. Uh, you know, children have died, uh, you know, some here, but more in Britain uh, because of the growing public skepticism of vaccines. Uh, so uh, that I say that's, I, I mean, you might think of the, I mean, people think of that as, you know, Marin County, California. So in, in the United States, it's kind of a, maybe a left thing. Uh, but there's a you know yuppie suburban mom kind of anti-vaxer uh, thing going on. There's a there's a far right fringe in Britain that's anti-vaccine. So uh, we 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 get these these weird kind of hard to sort out uh, complexes of sort of ideology interacting with scientific information. So it's it's that some people assume there's this binary of denial and there just isn't. It's much more it's much more complex than that. That's an interesting point. Um, so. Let me turn the focus specifically to ethics. And when I think about uh, coverage of climate science and ethics, the biggest thing that pops to my mind is the concept of false balance or false equivalence. And how, how do we represent science 
fairly when we're covering an issue that's hot politically. So could you give some examples from your work, um, you know, how you encountered that? You know, is that something that you saw as a problem more in the past than today? Well, it just, I'd really like to dive into that specific issue because it seems so fraught. Right. Sure, for the sake of the audience, I mean, I, I probably most people in here are journalists or have some connection to journalism, and so you've probably heard this term before, but for anybody who hasn't, um, false balance is the idea that we make a mistake in journalism if we take uh, uh, positions where there's sort of a huge weight of evidence on one side and not much evidence on the other side, and we treat them as equal. Um, it's called false balance because, of course, journalists are taught we have this, you know, powerful impulse toward um, balance, and you know, which makes perfect sense in a lot of contexts. I mean, if I'm covering uh, the city council, and you know, one side is trying to raise the sewer rates and the other side is not, and they both have arguments about what they want to do, then as a journalist, I quote them both, right? And you know, here's a perfectly structured little you know, political argument uh, uh, in which you try to, you know, you try to give more or less equal weight to, to both sides. False balance is when, and, and it, it applies even outside of scientific context. So, uh, you know, if in 1938 you'd been covering the rise of uh, Nazism in the United States, you know, we had entire Nazi route there of, People don't remember this, but uh, 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 Madison Square Garden filled up with a huge Nazi rally, you know, before uh, before the war. If you'd been a reporter covering that, and and you'd you'd basically devoted half the space in a story to the Nazis saying why they're good, and, and you know that that to me would be false balance, right? I'm sorry, I have no truck with Nazis, and and I you know I'm not I'm not going to label that as a uh, as an acceptable position. Uh, in the context of science. Uh, we, we have these sort of sort of clear examples. The, vac the vaccine thing is an interesting case. Uh, you know, the, the autism link is is based on uh, a, a study uh, published in I want to say 1998 by a guy named Andrew Wakefield in the UK in the Lancet of all places. So real science, uh, but a bad study from the outset. 12, uh, 12 kids. You know, he was claiming got autism uh, as a result of the m mumps, measles, rubella vaccine. Uh, and, you know, p the, the British papers really ran with that. that. And we, you know, for a year, there were just thousands of stories about the supposed autism link. Uh, we saw vaccination rates plummet in Britain. We saw uh, outbreaks of these diseases. We saw children die. Uh, it was a bad study to begin with on its face based on uh, 12 cases. What we subsequently found out was that Wakefield had been taking money from lawyers who wanted to sue the vaccine companies under the table. As I, as I sit here today, he's been uh, stripped of his medical license. The study has been completely retracted. Uh, but the damage uh, today is still not undone. That was, I'm not sure that was even a false balance case. That was, that was, that was sort of, you know, the stories then were 90%, you know, vaccines cause autism, and the scientific voices that were saying otherwise were just drowned out. So in the, in the climate case, we, you know, we've had the, we had this situation in the United States for many years in which journalists were reporting about climate science and what the scientists said, and then they felt obliged to sort of call up the climate deniers, you know, the, the very small handful of people who have any... Uh, training in atmospheric science who say that we don't have a problem. I've met all five of those guys, by the way. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, they were given sort of, you know, a third or equal weight in a lot of the stories. To, to this day, we still see this on CNN. You know, they still love to put, you know, Bill Nye up against some, you know, climate-denying uh, scientists, often not even a science, and pretend that these are sort of equal uh, positions. And it's complete nonsense. And so, when I got to the Times, I started arguing with my editors and saying, we have got to stop doing it. We weren't very bad about it compared to everybody else, I think, but we've got to stop doing this. And uh, I got, there was resistance at first, and then Hurricane H Sandy hit, uh, and we were all so emotionally gobsmacked. I mean, the editors at the New York Times lost their houses in Hurricane Sandy, and I remember sitting in... Uh, the office with uh, Jill Abramson and a whole bunch of editors 
uh, and having her say, this was the editor, the uh, editor in chief of the paper at the time, having her say, I, I'm just tired of this nonsense. You know, why are we listening to these people when it so obviously is happening? And, you know, we got to the point where, in a science piece at least, I, did, I was under no obligation to sort of call up climate deniers to sort of counter uh, the real science. We, we did, and when I was there, and we still do, quote them in political stories because they are politically relevant, right? Half the Congress are, are climate deniers. And, and uh, so it's been, a, it's been sort of this, you know, figuring out exactly how to um, calibrate. But I think, we, I think the times kind of led the way. And you see this is less and less of a problem in American journalism now, this false balance, at least on climate. So to come back to Superstorm Sandy, it's a really interesting example because it's one that allows a skeptic uh, to make a point that it's hard to introduce the nuance of what's, what the actual real point is. So am I, am I right that with Sandy, there really is no way for scientists to say that the storm was what it was, you know, it, it hit with that fury because of global climate change, but we can say uh, that the sea levels were higher and so there was more significant flooding and that caused more disruption. Is that is that right? So a skeptic can say, you can't say that, that climate change caused Superstorm Sandy, but there certainly are things that you can say about the effects of it that you can relate directly. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, by the way, sea level rise and is not a it's not a cause of global, a consequence of global warming. It is global warming. They are the same thing, basically. With the, you know, the most of the heat is going into the ocean, and as it goes into the ocean, the water expands, and that's the primary reason that the ocean is rising, not the only reason. And eventually, that will be the the, the rise will be dominated by the melting polar ice caps. But uh, but the the mere fact that the ocean is rising tells us to an absolute certainty that the planet is warming up. It could, you know, it's elementary physics. Um, uh, and yeah, so we've had a we've had a foot um, uh, or so of sea level rise in the last century. Uh, uh, along the certainly along the it's it's odd you know the the sea level actually varies from place to place people have a hard time wrapping their mind around that but it's true uh, we've had a foot of sea level rise off the east coast of the United States and uh, people actually ultimately were able to calculate how many more homes flooded during Hurricane Sandy because of that one foot of rise than would otherwise have been the case and it was a pretty large number it was like two hundred thousand households or something additional flooding beyond. Uh, beyond what would have happened, and so um, it, this is a ch this is a real challenge for journalism right now because we're still in this moment where we've begun to escape the historical variability of climate and move into uh, uh, climate um, events and climate extremes that are outside the realm of recorded human experience, but we're still in the early days of that, and so. We're still in this moment where we're struggling to explain to the public, yeah, this has happened before, but now it's become more likely. The heat waves have become more likely. The heavy rains have become more likely. Uh, you know, it, it, there's absolutely a climate contribution to the fact that India is now seeing, uh, you know, heat, heat waves of 120 degrees where it's dangerous to go outside. Uh, it's a change in the, in the risk distribution, and it's a bit of a subtle message to kind of explain that to people. And how, how can journalism do that? So how, you know, how can we get that messaging through? And did you ever have any luck as a journalist uh, persuading people or, or, or getting people to understand the science when they were skeptics? Did you change any minds? I hope so. <laughs> it's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, journalism has really changed, right? We, it used to be this kind of Stalinist information model, right, where we sort of throw things out at you and we hear nothing back. You know, now, of course, the, the Internet has completely changed that, and we hear back from the audience. Uh, and I would hear all sorts of things back from the audience when I would write these stories. I'd get this, you know, amazing gratitude and you know, long, thoughtful disquisitions from, you know, people at universities about how they're using, you know, our stories in their classes to teach their students. 
Uh, and then I would get, you know, things calling me a communist, you know, and a, you know, an Al Gore sympathizer and, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of dirty names. And, you know, I got threats. Uh, uh, are, did we change any minds? I mean, the polling would tell you. So after the financial crisis uh, in 08, 09, that time frame, uh, the, the percentage of the American public concerned about climate change went way down. Uh, concern for environmental issues, I think, always goes down during stressful economic times, and then people seem to really care about it when times are flush. Um, we're now in a rising trend. We've hit, if you look at the latest Yale polling, we've hit 70% of the American public says, yes, yes, it is happening. Uh, half, almost half the American public is now sort of absolutely convinced that it's happening, and uh, so uh, I think, I, I, I mean, that's, that's all I have to go on is to, you know, I've been doing this work for a decade. Other journalists, I think, even smarter than I, I am, have gotten uh, uh, really sophisticated in the way they present these stories. Uh, and, and, you know, we see, we see changes in public opinion. Some of that, let's be honest, though, is people are just finally beginning to see the stuff with their own eyes, right? They're seeing uh, these, uh, uh, these severe weather events and so forth. And I, I think it's the combination of the two. I just, like they're trying to figure out why are things changing in my backyard? And then they're seeing this journalism that, you know, explains it. And so it's slowly working. It's just that the problem is, you know, the problem is urgent. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, CNN is an outlet that you would you would uh, not see as ideal when it comes to false balance, and you know I think part of that part of that is that it's pretty cheap to have two talking heads yelling at each other, uh, and you know may drive may drive some clicks and some viewership. But who are people in this space that you admire, organizations that you admire? You know who does who does Justin Gillis read when he wants to know more about uh, about climate change? Um, I mean, that could be a long list, but um, if you, if you want to keep up with the journalism, with the best journalism, um, there's an outfit called Climate Nexus, spelled N-E-X-U-S, climatenexus.org. Uh, uh, they are essentially a foundation-funded kind of information clearinghouse, uh, almost like a PR firm for uh, climate change coverage. Uh, and they, you can sign up for a newsletter they have that comes out every weekday that, give, that gives you the headlines and then you can sort of then click through uh, to the coverage. I admire them a lot. I admire Climate Central, which is based in Princeton uh, and I think loosely associated with Princeton University. Some of you guys might know about Climate Central. Uh, the news organizations that now have really good uh, climate coverage, uh, the, the Times, you probably know, is staffing up uh, in... Uh, as, as I sit here right now, there's a, a dozen people, you know, on the case there, at least a dozen, uh, which is a big, big commitment um, in this day and age and a, and a big change from even a few years ago. Uh, the Washington Post has staffed, staffed up on climate. Uh, Vox News, VOX News, if you don't know about them, is absolutely essential reading. A guy named David Roberts at Vox is uh, one of the most intelligent people on the American scene, period, and certainly uh, one of the most intelligent commentators on this issue. Uh, I mean, there's a, li there's, a, there's a list to start. I could go on and on and on, probably. Well, that's good, though, yeah. right? Isn't that, isn't that good that there's a lot of work to point out that we admire? So now you've, you've left the Times um, as a news reporter. You still contribute um, opinion pieces. So how do you answer a critic who says, Aha, see, I told you all those years that he was biased. Now he's writing opinion stuff. He's just being transparent in his bias, uh, but he has always been that way. How do you, you know, you've pivoted from news to opinion, uh, still informed opinion. You know, there's, there's reporting to be done in, in uh, making those arguments, but how do you answer those people who attack you now saying this is what he always was, it's just labeling it differently? So my theory is that I need to make a slow, gentle transition um, from one to the other. And so the other day I scal called Scott Pruitt a brazen liar in uh, print. Uh, and, you did uh, not go gentle into that good night, did you, Justin? <laughs> my apologies to the audience for understating the case. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I take the position that um, 
good opinion writing is a form of journalism. Uh, in fact, I was taught opinion writing, you know, as a, you, do you guys have an opinion writing class here? You do indeed. You probably do, yeah. I was taught opinion writing uh, when I was in, in J school uh, a very long time ago. Uh, the best opinion writing is based on pretty deep reporting and pretty deep knowledge of a subject. Uh, and yes, you then go sort of a step beyond, and you you are more willing to sort of say, All right, okay, here are the implications of these facts. Here's what these facts ought to be leading us to do. Uh, but you must have start with a grasp of the facts. Where I think opinion writers get into trouble uh, is is you know when they stop doing real work and just start sort of bloviating you know uh, uh, all the time and uh, and and become insufferable and that I mean that seems to be kind of an occupational disease of opinion writers I am hoping to avoid that or to get run over by a truck or something before that happens <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, as as to your point, I mean, the climate deniers have been attacking me for many, many years. You know, I, I mean, there are entire websites, you know, devoted to debunking my, you know, communist journalism, uh, and and so, I I mean, I don't see how that's going to change. You know, I mean, uh, in fact, I mean, it's interesting. You know, when you you slap an opinion label on something, you 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 weirdly get. I'm getting less reaction to those pieces than I got to the more careful kind of uh, straight news stories. And it might be that that opinion label just sort of inoculates you in some way. I mean, if the idea is, you know, people are going to look at the opinion writing I'm now doing and sort of go back and uh, try to discredit, uh, you know, the earlier work, well, I mean, they all, they've already been trying. You know, they've been doing their best. Um, Interesting. Well, let's let's stay on Scott Pruitt and the EPA for a minute. Uh, it was a it was a bold column um, that you put out there, certainly. Uh, but I'm interested, particularly, you know, in I think it would matter for this community. Um, I, I'm interested in this proposed rule changing what science the EPA can rely on. So as I understand it, it's it, we're, we're talking about a shift uh, uh, to bar use of any study for which data is not made public. And you know, I, I am certainly not a health scientist, but my limited understanding of, our, uh, of, of, of this would tell me that that means a lot of public health data is just out because you could not protect um, the privacy of those yeah. Of, of those subjects, uh, I, I, certainly I am not the I am not the expert on this, but uh, but it really fascinates me this rule. Uh, yeah, this this thing is a scurrilous Trojan horse. Uh, it really is. Uh, I mean, all, all you got to all you got to do to know that is sort of look who's for it. You know, when the you know when the when the coal lobby is you know uh, spending lots of money to try to get an EPA rule through you can you can bet it's probably not a good thing right and you know meanwhile every doctor in america is against this cuz they understand what it would mean uh, just to kind of, it sounds it's one of these things that sort of superficially sounds good you know the EPA is saying uh, we're going to have a role that if all the data in these studies are not completely publicly available, we're going to discard the studies. Think about this for a minute. So we're trying. So let's say you have the misfortune to live out back from a a, a, a lead smelter, let's say, and we're going to try to figure out, you know, what are the health effects of you know having people live out back from lead smelters. So we're going to draw your blood and do a test on you, and maybe we do an IQ test on you and see if you've been made dumber by the lead smelting. <laughs> Uh, I have no reason to believe this is true, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, 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 and now, to, that study to be ethically done, in fact, to be approved at any competent university, including this one, the doctors would have to absolutely promise you the anonymity of your data, right? You, 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 it's going to be real data from, from a real person, from, a, from an epidemiological group of people, for example. Uh, but we're going to anonymize the data. That's the magic term here, so that anybody else could come in and reproduce that, but they're not going to be able to figure out who you are. Uh, th th this is what Pruitt wants to rule out, is, is using, using health studies with anonymized data. He wants to have a rule that says, we can only count that study if we have your exact name and address, right, and all the, he and all the health records associated. I mean, this is complete and absolute nonsense, right? It, it, it basically, it is an attempt, it is a naked attempt to throw out 90% of the useful epidemiological information that we have about... It's really that high a percentage? Uh, uh, well, I'm, get, I'm, I'm pulling that out of the 
there, but it's but it's a it's a very high percentage of the useful epi um, uh, about the health consequences of environmental health exposures, and uh, that's what they want to do. I mean, the you know the the people that are putting mercury in the air love this idea, right? That we're not going to have serious studies about mercury anymore as part of the EPA rulemaking. Um, I am, I am an optimist about this in the sense that it's so egregious that I do not think it can sort of stand up in court. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there's law in the books about how EPA has to do this, and Pruitt can't rewrite the laws, and I think those laws are inconsistent with uh, the rule he's trying to put into place, but don't be blinded about this thing. I mean, it's a, it's a very, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's just an erroneous uh, idea and being done for bad motives. Interesting. How important, how important is litigation now uh, with some of the changes um, that are being proposed for EPA? Mm -hmm. You know, are, are we are we destined to years of court cases fighting this and, and other sorts of things? Oh, I hope so. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the. <laughs> this is the. This is the golden. Uh, uh, you know, this is this is our rescue here. Um, yeah, you know, Pruitt came to Washington with this image of being sort of a right winger, but a brilliant lawyer. And in fact, the legal work they've been doing is so bad that they keep losing in court. So they've they've already got um, you know a whole bunch of uh, TRO temp temporary restraining orders against them on proposed rule changes. The um, the, the federal law, the Administrative Procedure Act requires these agencies when they put a rule in place, you've got to go through years of sort of um, study and analysis and public hearing before you finalize a rule. Uh, to undo that rule, you've got, to, you've got to reverse all that. You've got to go through years of analysis and public hearing, uh, and, and you've got to have a factual scientific basis for undoing the rule. Um, and they haven't, they haven't, they haven't taken those steps. They've just been throwing these things out, right, right and left. You know, very thin, often just a few pages on why they want to undo a rule. Um, that's going to get blocked in the court. So, uh, the there were just some of my colleagues at the Times just did some stories on this, and there were these kind of delighted quotes from the Green groups, you know, about how bad the legal work out of the EPA is right now. Uh, because they're all, you bet. I mean, they're they're geared up and they're suing right and left. And uh, so, if we're lucky, and I'm not saying every EPA rule on the books is perfect, not by uh, the you know, everything Obama did is perfect. But uh, if if we're lucky, you know, the Trump people will be out of office by the time a lot of this stuff is actually able to work its way through the courts. And I, I strongly suspect a lot of it, a lot of what they want to do, will never actually happen. It's interesting when I do uh, just that, that answer just called to mind when I when I go out and do a lot of public talks one of the slides I like to put up is journalism is hard <laughs> because I, I think there's a real fundamental misunderstanding among many people that this is an easy thing you know you talk to a couple of people you throw a couple of quotes together but I, just hearing that I'm like wow he's you know he's a, a science journalist but now he's having has to have this complex understanding of the law, um, he's talking politics, but you're, you're covering a lot of different things within one field. It, it, it's very challenging to take that kind of complexity and translate it uh, for an audience. But that said, journalism is hard. Uh, I always like to point out that journalism is done by humans. <laughs> Journalists are people too. And I think self-reflection is an important part of ethical practice. So what's a story, something uh, that you've done that you'd like the chance to do over. You maybe didn't get it right, or you, uh, you know, you took that money under the table to publish the Lancet story. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding about that. But what's what's something? I hope I'm just kidding about that, right? <laughs> um, uh, what's what's something that uh, you'd like to do over? <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of things, you know, of course. Particularly, I mean, every correction I ever had on the story, and there weren't that many of them, I'm happy to say, but uh, I would love to have not made that mistake. You know, often, you know, very sloppy, stupid mistakes. Um, uh, so the, that's, the, that's the obvious answer to your question. I think the more sophisticated answer is, relating to this beat specifically, is I, I went into this climate journalism thing out of a frustration with how it was being done, sort of feeling like the journalism of climate change in the United States just was not very good. Uh, 
hubristic enough to think I could sort of maybe uh, some way. Uh, and I went in thinking that if we wrote better stories, um, that that would actually change people's minds and sort of unlock the politics and kind of alter the trajectory of this issue. Um, and, you know, at, at the task of doing what I thought needed to be done, um, I feel like I succeeded in the sense that, I mean, I got, you know, 3,000, 4,000 word stories about climate science on the front page of the New York Times over and over and over. Um, I mean, trust me, it is not easily done. Uh, and yet, you know, in, in a way, through all the time I was doing that, the battle, the sort of political battle lines only hardened. If I, what I would really prefer to do again, if I could rerun those 10 years, I would start out with much more attention to the, all this business about sort of motivated reasoning and Testing, testing. Oh, there, there you go. Uh, ideological filters and, uh, 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 the, you know, the, the things that make people really, really resistant to actual factual information. And I think I would um, choose to do my journalism differently, at least somewhat differently, with those things in mind. For example, um, it's only relatively recent that I have... Um, um, yeah. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, only, it's only relatively recently that I've sort of turned my focus more or less full-time to the solutions. Uh, the solutions on climate are interesting because you, you poll the public and ask about climate change, you get about 60% saying, yeah, it's a problem. You poll the public and ask about clean energy, and you get 80% saying they like it. Uh, that 20 percentage point delta, I've just become more and more and more interested in this. You know, who are these people? Uh, and so I think, I think I'd run back the clock and I'd probably uh, turn, you know, uh, tilt the balance and be writing more about the solutions, more about the path forward, and less, less about the science of the actual problem. It's actually an interesting area of mass communication research that's starting to build, which we will hear more about today in our, in our uh, uh, later panels, that uh, solutions journalism does perhaps hold more power to change minds than journalism that describes problems. Uh, okay, with that, um, I'd love to open up for uh, audience questions. Our fine fellow, uh, Ben Pickman, he likes to call himself the, his, the senior fellow because this is his second year with us. Uh, he's gonna come to you with the mic and I'll, I'll ask you to hold your question until he reaches you so that people who are following us live online can be sure to hear uh, what you've asked. So, who would like to go first? We're that good. We just answered everything. <laughs> Here? Ben. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Justin, um, through all these years of covering uh, science stories at the New York Times, who did you think your audience was and is? It's a very prominent media organization, but uh, very interested in, in, in the ways you, you developed strategies for aiming at that audience. I very often, uh, as I was writing stories, thought of my Aunt Dale, 72, I think. Bright, wonderful lady, politically conservative, lives in Georgia. Uh, and I was often asking myself, will Aunt Dale understand this? Is it, am, I, am I writing above her head with these sentences? Uh, that a, is a bit of a cute, cutesy answer, but, it's, but, um, but, but, but it is true. And, and uh, I, I always try to have in mind that I'm writing to a public that is intelligent, um, not all college educated, uh, certainly not steeped in the jargon of climate science or usually any other subject for that matter. Uh, and so my goal was to sort of take people gently by the hand and kind of pull them through complicated topics, but at no point did I want to make them feel inadequate or stupid or like they couldn't understand this. Uh, 
And it's a, there's a fine art as a journalist to have this kind of tuning fork for where exactly is the public in their in their knowledge in their background on something uh, and there are little things you can do just remind people you know little sentences that just remind people of things that happened uh, I, I learned to take lots and lots of complexity and sort of sweep it under you know a subordinate clause somewhere <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, just, simplicity is the is the goal the idea that we're speaking to an audience that has has an eagerness and a willingness to understand but absolutely no um, specialized training and it's a fine trick because you know I want to write to that audience at the same time I want to write the piece in a way that you know the most sophisticated climate science scientist is going to have no objection to it right you know no objection to the way I'm explaining the subject to the public uh, you can judge for yourself you know the degree to which we sort of succeeded at that but that to me was always the goal and the and the target I had in mind can I ask a follow-up to that? And that is, um, I, to what extent did you pay attention to commenting on your stories? The, the Times has a really f quite fascinating uh, commenting model um, that, you know, by my run, incidentally, by a graduate of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. <laughs> um, uh, it, I always like to brag about them. They are, they're impressive. Um, so you know, the fact that the Times began to moderate comments pretty early on, and then that affected the behavior of commenters. People began to see that, you know, if they were putting in ad hominem attacks, they weren't getting through, and they either stopped commenting or stopped putting the attacks in there. How often did you engage with those comments? Did you read them, think about them? Did they become part of your, you know, the public was talking back to you in new ways. Did that matter? Uh, it mattered a lot. I mean, I, I think I read, uh, I think I read every comment ever posted on one of my stories. Wow. I, I read you get them. a lot of comments. Yeah, well, there, there were some. I mean, I, I had stories that had, you know, way into the thousand. I mean, I think one story came close to 9,000. So, uh, but yeah, there were a whole lot of, you know, 11.30 p.m. in that New York City apartment, you know, kind of sitting there reading, you know, reading the comments online. I think it was crucial to the tone of the Times, um, um, comment stream that we that we did the moderation. You know that's just been really fundamental to having uh, a a civil public discourse. And you know where the, these um, forums like Reddit. I mean most of them most of most online forums don't moderate comments. And uh, they you know when they don't the they, these things tend to turn into you know sewers of sort of name calling and ad hominem attacks and so forth. Um, I not only found it useful, people in their comment, you would get these really intelligent comments and people changed the way I did things. They, they When I was writing, um, to Sharon's point, when I was writing things that were unclear, that would show up in the comments and so it would change the way I would write it the next time. Um, I got entire story ideas out of comments. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, somebody in a comment reminded me that Ronald Reagan had signed with with glee. By the way, um, the most important coastal um, barrier island uh, resource protections ever passed in the history of the United States, uh, and I, I vaguely knew about that. But but um, this is this is actually in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. This 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 commenter saying we you know we we ought to, we need to revive this and sort of do more of this and I went and um, researched that law and hunted down uh, the guy in Congress who sponsored it a Republican in Congress who sponsored it who was still alive uh, who then came to New York and saw me and I wrote a whole column about uh, that law and what we could sort of learn for it from it in modern times so um, the ability of the readership to sort of talk back, I think, has been crucial. It's made journalism a lot better. Hey, do we have another question? Yeah, right I here. guess I'm the question person. Okay. Um, I'm a UW-Madison journalism graduate. Hey, so, yeah, we right. love you. <laughs> <laughs> love you. Um, I'm the editor of the Crawford County Independent in Gaze Mills, Wisconsin. It's a weekly little ways away from the New York Times, I guess, but, you know, we pride ourselves in environmental <laughs> reporting um, and have one 
some awards over that. All right, but my question is like, what what you were speaking to is like, we we could talk about problems we have. And oh my God, we have problems in my county, plenty of them, um, erosion and just uh, it goes on and on. Um, but I feel like you have to sometimes do stories about successes. And one of the successes where I live is there are now bald eagles everywhere. Where 40 years ago, there were 300 breeding pairs in the lower 48 states. So I send my reporter out there, my part-time reporter, because that's what I have for a staff. Um, and they're young, and they're in their 20s, and I say, this is a success story. Do this story, you know, like, like, you know, there's an eagle sitting in a tree in my yard, you know. This is a huge success, the, the, the comeback of the eagles. But I've sent two reporters out to do this story, and uh, I'm old, they're young. I need to do this story, I guess, Kathy, I don't know. But... Uh, how, how does that work? Can you speak to doing stories about, like you were saying, about the success? We've had successes environmentally. And I don't think there's enough stories done about it. And, and I have a problem sending young reporter out to do that story. They don't, they don't know the before part. Um. I don't know that I have a terrible good answer for you. I mean, the the it, it's true that I mean the the whole environmental movement in the United States is sort of a victim of its own success in a sense, right? We uh, when in in the fifties and sixties uh, when rivers were catching on fire, you know, the Cuyahoga River, you know, caught on fire not once actually, but multiple times. One time became sort of a big national story. Uh, you know, the, the American bald eagle was on its way to extinction, uh, largely, not exclusively as a result of uh, the environment. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, an awful lot of that has been cleaned up as a result of the landmark environmental laws that we passed in the 1970s. And so uh, now we have, in a way, we have sort of this different class of problems now that's like harder to understand. I mean, global climate change is this you know, global amorphous thing. You can't actually see it in the atmosphere, so it's sort of harder to understand. Um, uh, it's absolutely true that we've had huge environmental successes. It's absolutely true that we need to, to celebrate them and write stories about them. Uh, you, you, can, you can make this critique more broadly of journalism, right, and that people often do, that, you know, you're so, fo you're so relentlessly focused on the negative and it really depresses people. Um, the Times has started, I don't know if any of you are paying attention to this, but the Times has started doing a weekly digest of the good news in the paper, <laughs> so, uh, if you're, you know, if you if you're trying to stave off, you know, the existential horror, you know, and and you and you want to give yourself sort of a daily dose of uh, a weekly dose of you can you, you can call up that digest and you know click through to all of those stories, uh, and there's often 15 or 20 stories on that list, uh, which is maybe a low percentage of what the New York Times publishes, but. Uh, I, I, I kind of buy their critique that, you know, we need more, we need, we need to f highlight successes, we need to focus more on solutions. I like the solutions journalism uh, rubric and the kind of trying to organize a focus around that. Um, uh, I mean, there was, was a period when it was being sold as like, you know, the magic answer to all the problems in journalism, which I don't think it is. Uh, uh, but but I like it, and I'm sort of sort of with you. As for the problem that sort of young people, you know, don't know where we came from or how bad it used to be very recently, it was ever thus, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, uh, and there is no solution uh, to that, but but reading and education, and for us old folks to keep sort of gently wrapping them on the knuckles, saying, "Here's what here's what it used to be like," and you know, here's the book you need to read. Somebody, uh, 
in one of the classes that I spoke to earlier this week, asked me for a summer reading list of science and environmental books, and I'm in the process of putting that together. And uh, there's going to be a heavy dose of history in there, I think, you know, to sort of just understand where we've come from. Well, if you share that with us, we'll circula certainly circulate it uh, as well. I think, um, you know, to just follow up on that point, I, it's not just about negative versus positive stories, but I think when you dig in and look at the amount to which conflict drives the news agenda or, or reporting within a specific story as opposed to collaboration. I think that's a, an important critique as well. Okay, do we have another question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, thanks. You, Hi, Tom. Justin, you, you alluded to, uh, you know, looking back and thinking you'd do it differently as far as the coverage, like some, maybe spending more time on solutions like you were just alluding to. Uh, my question would be, one, what are some of the solutions you wish you had talked about or might still talk about. Uh, you alluded to renewable energy. Uh, I'm aware of renewable uh, revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend is another idea that's out there. What ideas would you pursue or like to see pursued in climate change journalism going forward, either with if you do it or if you could recommend other people do it? Well, this is sort of uh, the entire point of the book I'm writing, right, is with a co-author and our goal is to um, give people some sense of uh, what exactly do we need to do, right? What, what, uh, what, uh, what approaches would make a difference? Um, uh, I, I, you know, we, we, did do, we did do things that looking in retrospect, I'm really proud of. I mean, we did a, we did a piece in about, um, oh, I was not the writer, I was the editor of that piece. Uh, saying that um, LED lights were kind of a magic answer to some of our problems um, uh, because, you know, it's a radical improvement in the efficiency of lighting. It's like a 90% drop in, uh, in the power consumed. You know, the old light bulbs, any, anything that you can touch and feel that it's hot, uh, unless it's a heater, it's wasting energy. Period. It's wasting energy. And so, you know, the old light bulbs, of course, were wasting 90% of the energy they used. We flip that around now with LED bulbs. I, I'm pleased to sit here and tell you, I think the story we did on the front page of the Times 10 years ago helped to push that trend forward. Now, it was already then a gathering trend. Um, I, the, one of the, this is a bit complex, but bear with me. One of the, the core idea in the book I'm writing um, is going to be this idea of learning rates or learning curves. As we scale new technology, uh, you, you can calculate a rate at which the price declines for each doubling of the global market. So for solar power, that turns out to be about 19%. So for every doubling of the global market, the price declines by 19%. The cost declines by 19%. It's about, I want to say, 14% for wind power. It's on the order of 20% for LED bulbs. This is telling you the answer to the problem, right? The, what we need to do is scale the solutions by any means necessary. I mean, I like standards. Uh, I'm okay with subsidies. I see them as a temporary means to an end. Um, and I think people don't understand that. I think some of the resistance to, let's say, the subsidies for renewable energy has been people not understanding that we are doing this as a conscious strategy to get the market large enough to, that we get to the point where the stuff can compete on pure economic grounds. And by the way, we are nearing that point now. Certainly in the American Midwest and the Great Plains, we have right now got utilities shutting down old, fully amortized coal plants in favor of new uh, wind farms because, because building new wind farms is cheaper than just the operating cost uh, of the old coal. If any of you in the room get your power from Excel, um, your company um, has promised to be at 60% renewable by 2025. So we're now talking seven years from now. So um, it's happening out there. And I, I wish I had understood earlier in my career, I guess, um, the economic formalities of why it's happening and how this learning curve business works. And I would have done more journalism explaining that to people. My uh, absolution for my sins is I'm now trying to write a book that explains that. So. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Like, this lady's had her hand up. 
Oh, well, then we have time for two last questions. We'll go here and then over here. We like to be inclusive. And, I, and I'm sorry, I was shutting you out over here. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about international climate reporting, um, and specifically the differences between climate coverage in the U.S. versus other countries around the world. This climate denial business uh, seems largely to be an Anglophone thing, uh, meaning the English-speaking countries. Uh, and that's not just my opinion. That was a formal study done by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford in which they looked around the world and they looked in multiple languages and they could find sort of, you know, vigorous climate denial only in English. Um, I don't know if it's been, you know, maybe this is, you know, an odious American export, you know, where we've sort of uh, contaminated the Brits and the Australians. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you, don't, you don't see... I mean, as weird as um, British politics are right now, um, you don't see climate denial as a major factor there. It's just not been a big part of the journalism, and it's and you know the Conservative Party is just as committed uh, as the Liberal Party to uh, the, the Labor Party to um, climate action. Uh, uh, you know, Australia is a different story. Uh, 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 I th in, in Germany and most of Europe, uh, the, the coverage is sort of all about the crazy Americans, you know, and why do they have this, you know, bizarre, you know, far right uh, clack that stops them from, you know, uh, uh, achieving anything on on climate change? And um, anyway, that's I mean, there there are these very pronounced differences that seem to sort of reflect, you know, maybe national character. I don't know. Oh, um, hi. Oh, we have <laughs> hit the wrong one. Yeah. Okay, so I have been thinking about becoming a journalist for a very long time, and I want to be able to cover those very controversial issues. However, on something so crazy as climate change, where it's really hard to keep out your political opinion, what is that correct balance you need in order to not be super opinionated, but also have the facts in order to be able to convince people to be on your side. I mean, the the artists the artists simply start with the facts um, uh, as best we can discern them. It's bizarre, really, that this issue has somehow become part of the American culture wars. I mean, I don't really understand how it got pulled into and and turned into sort of a culture war item, but that's what's happened. Um, nevertheless. We have thermometers. You know, those thermometers are telling us something. Uh, we have scientists who spend their lives trying to make sense of what the thermometers are telling us, trying to make sense of the physical causes. So, as as a journalist, I mean, I think you have to start with the 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 science itself, um, recognizing. Yeah, Let's be clear here. There's lots of legitimate controversy within the science of climate change. Uh, there's a I, sometimes on the I draw on, on the board for people. You know, here's a sane box, and you know the scientists are in here having real arguments about uh, the you know exactly how sensitive is the Earth to to greenhouse gases and so forth. And you know then there's this crazy box over here of people who say things like you know CO2 is not a greenhouse gas. I'm sorry, you know they do that experiment in elementary school now. So um, <laughs> as a journalist, you 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 you. you you, you, you start with sort of the hard facts, I think, and then you kind of radiate out from there uh, and do your best to sort of cover the controversy. I don't really have a better answer for you than that. And then our final question. Thank you for your patience. Oh, well, it's, it's not really my strong suit, but I've done my <laughs> best. Um, thank you very much for, for this whole talk, and your answers have been fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm also, like Charlie, from sort of a, the dark part of the journalism world, which is uh, radio and talk radio. And I think that we really ignore uh, the use of, uh, of broadcast talk radio in terms of addressing this. Uh, I no longer working in talk radio after many years, but I have been working in terms of the issue of addiction and striking uh, issues that parallel, in a sense, some of what you're dealing with, which I find that people are have uh, complicated belief systems 
and that bringing them facts uh, in that context, at least in the call radio call in radio context, is not going to necessarily change minds. So you really have to address their belief systems, perhaps ask them questions, respect their belief systems, and offer sort of interesting things or ways of looking at it that might be different. I also think that it's worth looking at uh, the research that's been done, <clears throat> maybe this has been mentioned already, on motivational interviewing in terms of using the techniques that are used with people who are addicted to drugs to, uh, to change and start to break down some of that complex of belief. So I'd love your comments. Uh, I'm all for it. Um, you know, it's my, it's my basic comment. It's funny, I was just talking to Dean Shaw about this, you know, we almost need sort of an, uh, an academic discipline of bringing this knowledge that we have about the way people's beliefs, beliefs work and their minds work and the sort of how the ideological filters work and applying that to uh, the climate problem and maybe the vaccine problem and a handful of other, other, these other things where we have a sort of bizarre public uh, conversation going on. I basically agree with you. I agree with you about the underutilization of the airwaves, not just radio, but television. I mean, television is a disaster on the subject of climate change. You know, it's like to the extent we get anything, it's this kind of false balance from CNN, almost nothing. I mean, even MSNBC, which for a while was doing some things, is not doing very much anymore. I don't know if, would anybody here classify podcasting as a radio? I mean, it seems to me that it's just time shifted radio like that's all it is uh uh and i think podcast the podcasting trend is a golden opportunity um there's already you guys could google this if you want to there's already something called the energy transition show uh run by a guy out of colorado that's a podcast um they want money to subscribe which i'm paying them but uh, uh it's worth it uh, and and we I mean we probably need sort of ten or twelve you know podcasts on climate change in the various sort of aspects for for the audience out there. So anyway, I'm I'm agreeing with you that I think we need to make more creative use of the available channels and uh, apply a more intelligent sensibility about about the way people's minds work. I think think some of that is also the the whole sort of trusted messenger thing. We need to. We need to hunt out, you know, more climate scientists who are also, uh, I don't know, evangelical Christians like Catherine Hayhoe, and you know, put them before the public. Um, you know, people who can who who can sort of break down the walls of distrust, as it were. Excellent. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you, Justin, for being here uh, to start our day. I, I found it incredibly informative and enlightening. I'd also like to thank UW-Madison and University Communications. You're here uh, working really hard this week as our science writer in residence. Um, and so this is just one portion of uh, many, many things that you've been doing this week. So we're really grateful um, to UW-Madison and, UW and University Communications uh, for partnering with us um, in making this happen. That's been a, a long-standing program and 30-some years and something that has just been incredibly enriching for uh, for the journalism school. So again, could, thank could you I, for being here. Could cool. I say thank you guys for the opportunity to do it? It's, it's actually been, I mean, this is one of the most important universities in the history of the United States in its influence on the American public, you know, the vitamin D discovery here. And, and um, so it's been, I mean, they've been running me sort of, my feet are tired and my throat is tired, but uh, it's, it's just been an extraordinary honor. So thank you, thank you.